understand. Uh, just real quick about the Operation Christmas Child. Yesterday, we had someone deliver 250 boxes themselves as a couple. So that was really cool to see. I don't think they're affiliated with a church, or at least it wasn't. They weren't doing it together with a church, if I'm not mistaken. Andy's been receiving those. And then later in the day, when I wasn't here, uh, church came and they delivered like 650 something boxes. <laughs> so in our fellowship hall, we have a bunch of them lined up that we still need to pack and then take. But uh, I heard a little bit about that church experience from my wife. She was here. Um, she said that they actually started three years ago. And it started from a small group, our youth group, small group. And then it's come to them uh, three years later giving over 650 boxes as a church. So that's pretty cool to see. But anyways, we're thankful that we get to experience that this year. And hopefully, you know, as a church too, I don't know how many people are giving, but I do pray you guys are. And if you haven't, you have till today to get your boxes. Or even, no, well, technically, you have till tomorrow morning because we're actually open as a donation center from 8 to 10. Andy will actually be here as well. Can we give Andy a hand? He's been here this whole week and he's been taking care of that. So we're very thankful. But we'll also be open here from 8 to 10 tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow. So if you wanted to do a last minute uh, gift box, you can do that and bring it tomorrow as well. Or today from 2 to 6. Okay, we'll be open as well. All right. Well, today is Thanksgiving Sunday. So another quick announcement is that we do have a Thanksgiving meal. Yay. Uh, the KM has graciously, yearly, uh, they make for us too. So enjoy that as well later on. Um, so don't leave uh, after our service today, but enjoy the meal provided by our KM and Thanksgiving centric. Okay. Um, with that in mind, we're not actually having a Thanksgiving sermon um, because we've been in Matthew and uh, I've been driving us through Matthew because I want to try to get us to finish by Easter of next year. So I've been trying to time that along, but um, we started talking about Matthew 24 last week, and signs of the end, and also how Jesus is talking and teaching about his second coming. So we're going to do that again today. We're going to have more of an overview about Jesus' second coming, and the, the title of the uh, sermon is The Return of the King, speaking of Jesus' return, not his first coming, but his return. And as I reminded you guys last week, too, hopefully you remember that, Advent season is coming, which, in which we remember Christmas, and it leads up to Christmas, but Advent means coming. And so normally what we do celebrate, of course, is Jesus' first coming. But that word doesn't entail just his first coming. It means coming. And we know that Jesus did come before, but he's also going to come again. And so this Christmas season, we're actually going to be focusing on his second coming because that's what Matthew does and Jesus teaches on in these passages. Um, and so that's also why we're on this theme too, okay? So uh, we're going to read from Matthew 24, and we're going to read verses 29 through 35. So it's a short passage today, and um, we're going to really focus on verses 29 through 31. But let's read that. Uh, the word of the Lord, Matthew 24, starting from verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven, heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the, four, from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Verse 32. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Amen. Let me pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you, Jesus, for teaching on these things to your disciples and so that we could know what awaits in terms of your return, God. And as today is Thanksgiving Sunday, we do want to have thankful hearts. Um, yeah, ingratitude is a sin, God. I don't know if we always see it that way, but it also keeps us hardened in our relationship with you. Um, it keeps atheists away from you, oh God. But Lord, I, I do pray that you would, um, yeah, properly fill our hearts with thanksgiving because the air we breathe, everything that we have is from you, Lord. Um, and that as that increases in us, Lord, that we would um, live in light of that, God. But we thank you most of all for Jesus and not only for what you did on the cross 
for the, the things that you accomplish in your first coming, but also for the promise, the certain promise that you will come again, Lord. And that's always been a great motivation and a hope and a comfort for your people. May that be so in this generation as well, now for your believers. And so teach us as well about these things, we pray. Be with me. Apart from you, I can do nothing. So we thank you. And in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So uh, let me just ask quickly, what are some things that you are looking forward to? What are some things you are looking forward to? I don't know if maybe some of you are looking forward to this week. Maybe, uh, you know, it's a shortened week of, of work. If you're in school, some people don't even have school this week, too. So yay. Um, maybe a Thanksgiving meal, too. I it's good to look forward to. Uh, so there may be things like that in the media. Maybe some of you are looking forward to a vacation sometime. You know, Christmas season's coming. I know it's busy, but it's also uh, opportunities to maybe get away and to go on a trip or something like that. We have um, one brother that's, and is she, Bobby's not here. Okay, I'm not sure. But um, that's getting married, so hopefully they are looking forward to getting married. We have a, another, yes, we have a another brother who's engaged as well in our group, and so perhaps they're looking forward to their marriage dates as well. Um, I don't know if any of you are looking, oh, as kid parents, some of you maybe are looking forward to when your kids get older and they're out of the house, but most of you have young kids, so that's still a ways away. Um, we, we're, we're there, so yes, that's good. Um, I don't know if any of you are looking forward to retirement, retirement, um, probably most of you aren't thinking about that yet, but uh, hopefully you don't actually, I hope. You know, for me, I've said, I don't want to retire officially. I'm sure I'll have to stop, you know, pastoring, doing things at, at a certain point, but I would still want to continue to work for the Lord in, in some ways. Um, how many of you are looking forward to death? <laughs> now, that doesn't mean that I have a death wish or that I want to die. Um, but as Christians, we actually should look forward to death, right? Uh, it's interesting because, you know, my mom, she's older and um, I hear her something, sometimes talking on the phone with her friends who are older too. You know, they're in their mid to late 80s. And a lot of them, their husbands have passed away. You know, men tend to die younger than women, it seems like. But uh, I always hear them say at certain points of like, oh, you know, I just got to go. You know, I just, I just got, ah, we've lived long enough. So it's, it's, that's that time. It's the time to die. You know, <laughs> they're saying it that way. And some, it's not like with great joy, but then it's not also with this dread either. It's, it's just, it's time. And, you know, they're believers. And I think there is some of that where there's like, yeah, I'm okay with that, you know, and, and there's suffering in this life and stuff. So take me Lord, right? And I'm looking forward to seeing him. How many of you look forward or even think about looking forward to not only seeing Christ, you know, if, if we die and we go uh, to stand before him, but for his return, how many of you think about that? How many of you live in light of the fact that he promises to come again, right? How many of you look forward truly to that and anticipate his coming? Well, we should, we should. The second coming of Christ is vitally important. Okay? Not just what he did when he first came, but also the promise that he'll come back. You know, it's interesting, some statistics, I'll just give you one. I didn't know this, but I, I was made aware of this, that you know, in, in the Bible, for every mention of the first coming of Christ, there's actually eight mentions for his second coming. So there are eight more times the Bible talks about his second coming than it talks about his first coming. So that should tell us something as well, uh, and the importance of his second coming and how significant this teaching, this doctrine should be in our lives. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have this kind of like broader overview of his second coming, and we'll be talking about that more as the weeks progress. Um, as we get into Advent season, uh, the first week of December, and the passages also speak of his second coming. Um, but let me ask a couple of things or talk about a couple of things, preliminary, if you will, about the second coming of Christ. One is, is it going to be doom or is it glory? Because in this passage we just read, we see elements of both. So for example, in verse 29, um, says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. That sounds pretty gloomy. That sounds like doom, right? Um, and the Bible does describe the coming of Christ, or other words it uses as the day of the Lord, as being something that will be bringing a measure of doom, or the, the proper word there is judgment. So we do see that when it comes to the coming of Christ. But we also see glory, because what does it say in verse 30? 
Um, they will see uh, the second half. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Well, that sounds glorious, doesn't it? And it should. Okay? So even for the Christian, we have to understand the second coming of Christ, or at least the time before he returns. We talked about this last week. There will be doomy and gloomy things. Um, there'll be you know, false Christ. We talked about that. There'll be tribulations, you know, Matthew, the previous passage. There will be um, persecution and martyrdom for those who belong to Christ. There'll be abominations and blasphemous acts against God. There will be great tribulation. So in that sense, for the follower of Christ, before Christ's return, there will be gloom. I wouldn't say doom because we're not being judged, but it'll be hard, right? There'll be tribulations. And we talked about that too. Just, and even now, even if he's, his return is not tomorrow or imminent, um, meaning, you know, in real soon, although it could be, there's still deception, there's tribulation, there's temptation we face. And so we are to endure. Christians are to endure to the end. So when we talk about the second coming of Christ, even for the Christian, there are elements of doom or hardship that we need to be aware of. But when Christ comes ultimately, what is that? It's glory. It's glorious, right? When he returns. I mean, that's the longing of our heart, or it should be. That's the satisfaction of everything we wanted and we waited for. It's, it's the fulfillment of all hope, right, when Christ comes. And so in that sense, it's glory. It's glorious. Now, for the non-believer, someone who is not in Christ, then, what is the second coming of Christ like? Well, maybe to measure before he comes, you know, they could be, I wouldn't say glory, but they could be like, well, I'm living the way I want, I'm experiencing the world and the pleasures of the world, so maybe it's at least pleasurable, and maybe with more unrestraint and uh, selfishness and people living, you know, that way, even as Christ's return nears, maybe in that sense, um, they'll enjoy it, perhaps. But when he comes, though, what will it be for them? It will be doom, because it'll be judgment. It'll be judgment. Okay? So we need to understand that the second coming of Christ brings both elements, because he will judge all people, but those who are in him, it'll be glorious, because this is what we we're waiting for, the followers of Christ who've endured. But then for those who rejected Christ, it will be doom. It will be judgment. So that's one thing about his second coming, and the Bible describes it in that, those terms throughout. You know, the day of the Lord and the glory of it, his appearing, but also the judgment for those who don't trust him. Okay. Now, let's ask another question, a general question. Is his second coming literal or figurative? I hope that's clear for all of you guys, or most of us. It should be pretty simple, but um, some people may say, well, it's not a literal coming. It's just more figurative, and the Bible is using figurative language. It's interesting in, this, in these passages, uh, these verses, verse 29 and 30, again, um, there are some descriptions there that seem to be figurative and, and perhaps are. You know, again, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its lights, the stars will fall from heaven. Um, scriptures uses language like this in a figurative sense to describe God's judgment. Right? Um, in the Old Testament, that's true, Isaiah 13 Verses 10 and 11, and then, I'm sorry, 9 and 10, and then verse 13 as well, uses similar language. You know, this cosmic phenomenon, the sun darkening, etc., things like that. So the Bible does use that kind of language to describe God's judgment, but in a figurative sense. But it's interesting, actually, because, you know, when the temple was destroyed, which we talked about last week from the passage, you know, Matthew 24, verses 1 and through 28, but... Um, you know, when the temple was destroyed in Jerusalem, AD 70, there was actually reports of cosmic phenomenon that took place during that time. You know, I mentioned that historian Josephus, um, and he was the historian for the Jews at that time. But remember, he was also part of the siege of Jerusalem by the Romans. He was in it because he was fighting for the Jews as well. So while he was there witnessing all these things, he also recorded things. And he actually recorded this, and he prefaced it by saying, look, I'm not hallucinating, I'm not crazy, but this is what I saw and others saw during that time when judgment came on Jerusalem and the, the temple was destroyed. He said, before sun setting, chariots and troops of soldiers in their armor were seen running. So up to that point, that seems normal, right? If there's a battle and the Roman soldiers are around them, and you know that, that should just describe what's happening, but this is what he says. Running about among the clouds <laughs> and, and surrounding the city. So he said people, not just him, witnessed something in the clouds that looked like soldiers running around. And 
I don't think he was on something, you know, he, I don't think he was hallucinating, but this is what he described. And so there was an element perhaps of even this phenomenon in the sky that took place, you know, as judgment came. But I would say this, a lot of times the Bible uses figurative language to describe God's judgment, what it will be like. So it's not literal. However, when we come to the second coming of Christ, is that literal or is it figurative? Well, the Bible is absolutely clear about that. He literally will come. He will come physically. He will come personally. Okay? We know that. And how do we know that? Well, the language here says as much, you know, um, in verse 30, they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. But it also points to something that was going to happen a little bit later. And we see that in Acts chapter 1, when after Jesus has died on the cross and then he's risen, he spends some time with his disciples, and then what happens? He ascends, goes back up, right? And remember that? In, in, in Acts chapter 1, uh, verses 9 through 11, describe that. But let me read a little bit of that. After he's with his disciples, and then, you know, they're asking him in verse 6, like, when are you going to restore the kingdom? And he's like, it's not for you to know the times or seasons, but I, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And after he finishes his command, his last words, if you will, before he ascends, then we read this. When he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, on a, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. That's literal. That was historical. And the angels are saying what? This is how he's going to return. Okay. So we know that this description of the coming of Christ again is literal because he already ascended once physically, and people were there, witnesses were there, and the promise was that he will come back in the same way. Now, the ascension is not as great in, in terms of greatness and, and magnitude as his coming, second coming will be, because there was only probably about 120 disciples who witnessed this. There were no angels, no trumpet blasts, but he was lifted up. But the angels did say he will come in a similar manner. He will descend from the heavens, and he will come. Okay? And so we also know that about his second coming. So let me um, give us a little bit more about what this passage in the scriptures reveal about what the second coming will be like. Will be like okay? I've already mentioned the first thing. It will be physical. It will be physical. Right? Um, this is important because I, I hope that you desire and you experience this, and I pray for this as well. We always want Christ to be in our midst. You know, we want the Holy Spirit to be in our midst. We pray for that. We pray for his presence. We ask that Jesus would come down in a spiritual sense. We should ask that whenever we gather to worship, you know, whenever you're in a small group, whenever you're just praying alone in our days, Lord, be with us, right? So we long for his presence, but that is, in this life, a spiritual presence that we experience. But the Bible says that one day we will experience his physical presence with us. I don't know exactly what that's going to be like, but I know that that's better than his spiritual presence. Right? Because he's glorified. He's, yes, he's still going to come physically as the, the risen and the glorified son. And so in that sense, he does have a physical body, and the Bible describes that. But it's not like he's limited in his humanity like he was in the first time. His glory is released now when he returns. There's nothing held back. And so when we see him face to face when he returns, it's going to be glorious. Right? And so we are promised that, that his second coming will be physical. It will be literal. It will be face to face. He's not coming as an angel, or he's not sending an angel or some representative. He will come personally. Okay? And that is good news. Uh, what's another thing about his second coming? It will be visible for all to see. It will be visible for all to see. We read in verse 30 as well, then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. This is a public thing. This is not um, a corner of the earth, you know, or a, cor a little corner where, of the world where Jesus will come, or it's not secret. This will be for all the world to know that Jesus has come. Now, when I was thinking about this, I did have, you know, a question like, I can't see, you can't see, we can't see the sky right now, in, even in Texas for that matter, even in somewhere in the States, but certainly we can't see it in China, 
right? And right now, it would be like nighttime, right? Um, or other places of the world. So how will all the world see? I, I, I don't know. And so I thought, and I don't think this is true, but I was like, well, maybe you know, the internet will, will help that when he comes because you know, someone could record something in Israel because maybe he'll come in Israel because you know, that area. And then you know, like five seconds later or a couple minutes later, it'll be broadcast to other places of the world and we'll all know he came. Perhaps, perhaps, right? That, that is possible that if he came and people saw it as visible, the whole world would know soon enough, right? But the Bible seems to describe something bigger and glorious. And, you know, verse 27 of Matthew 24, which we read last week, but in describing a little bit about the coming of the Son of Man says, For as the lightning comes from the east and, as, and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. So it describes like this lightning that will be seen through all the earth. I don't know how, you know, that's not above my pay grade, but there's going to be something very visible and public about his coming. It's not going to be secret. It's going to be for all to know, to see. Okay? So that's another thing that the Bible seems to teach. It's visible. It's public for all to see. Uh, another thing about his second coming, it'll be sudden. It'll be sudden. Um, you know, that phrase is used in various places, but he will come like a thief in the night. We'll talk about that a little bit more in some of the subsequent passages. Uh, but it'll be unexpected, right? People won't expect him, even though we're supposed to be ready for his coming, but there is a suddenness. And then, like we've already mentioned to you, it will be glorious. It will be glorious, right? And again, we see that at the end of verse 30. He will come with power and great glory and great glory. And I don't know exactly how that will feel or what that will manifest, but seeing him will be, you know, whether, you know, aspects of light shining, but there'll be, you know, this beauty we've never seen, this power that's revealed in his coming. Okay? We can be sure of that. And then the last thing I want to say about, you know, these general things about his coming is the Bible also seems to indicate it will include the elect or those who are in Christ, those who are in Christ. Okay. So in that sense, the Bible seems to indicate that he's not coming alone that way. He's actually going to come with those who believe in him, those who belong to him. So 1 Thessalonians 4 uh, 16 and 17 is an important passage. Actually, 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians talks a lot about the second coming of Christ uh, throughout those letters. But in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 and 17, we read this. This is the Apostle Paul talking about the second coming of Jesus. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. You guys notice that description there? So what Paul is saying is when Jesus comes, um, the dead who have already died that were believers, that were in Christ, they will be raised up, right? They will rise and they will be in their... Uh, resurrected bodies, okay? and they will meet Jesus in the air as he comes, and then those who are still on the earth at that time that are following Christ, that are believing Christ, they also will rise up. They will be lifted up and meet Jesus. Now, this is why I believe, and some theologians don't, but I do believe the scripture seems to be pretty clear on this. There is no um, secret rapture. If you've, you know, you, you know the term rapture, where it is talking about literally like being lifted up, right? Being raptured up. And so this description does say or indicate that there is a rapture of sorts. There is this lifting up. So uh, the, the dead in Christ will be raised up and will meet him in the sky. And also those who remain who are still in Christ will also meet him in the sky. But the picture there, I believe, is uh, what it's showing is that this is all in line with Jesus coming down, returning this is his return. So believers will meet him as he returns, come up and meet him. That will be the rapture, quote unquote. And then what will they proceed to do? Come down with him. Come down with him. Right? And the Bible is also clear on this. I could say this with more uh, in, you know, strength and, and conviction. There's no secret rapture. Right? It's not like people are just going to disappear and then, whoa, what happened? The Bible doesn't. It, it's, it's public again. You know, there's trumpet blasts. Right? There's all these announcements and stuff, too. It's not meant to be secret. Okay? It's public. So we see that as well. But when he comes, the king will not return alone. 
It seems, the Bible seems to indicate that his people will come with him. Now, if someone disagrees with that, I'm not going to fight or go to the, you know, like, hey, you're not a Christian, but I, I do believe there's some clarity there as well, okay? Uh, definitely with the first four, we see what it'll be like. The Bible is clear about those things, all right? Um, so those are some things about his return, what it will be like. All right, another general question, overview about his second coming. How do we know he will return? How do we know he will return? How can we be sure that he will? Well, something that maybe sometimes you use with your kids or, um, yeah, even with people. The Bible says so, right? The Bible says so. And we should be able to say that, and with conviction, we ought to, but it does. Verse 35, what does it say? Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Okay? Jesus is saying, yes, these things will pass. You know, even the first heavens and the earth, and you know, there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. Those things will pass away even, but my words will not. You can be certain because he gave his word. Jesus says these things. Okay? His word says this, that he will return. So we can be certain because his word tells us so. Another reason why we can be certain that he will return we touched on this last week, but remember the prophecy about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem? It happened. It already happened. Now, when Jesus prophesied that, that was about A.D. 32, 33. But remember, the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. So within 40 years, his prophetic word, if you want to use a secular term, his prediction, it came true. So the prophecy was fulfilled in the immediate if that was fulfilled, then we ought to believe that this will be fulfilled, right? The, 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 the second part of what he was teaching, not just that Jerusalem would be destroyed and the temple would be destroyed, but that he would return. And these signs would happen prior to his coming. And so since the temple prophecy came to pass, that's evidence and proof of what he promised when it comes to his return will come to pass as well. Okay? And so that's another reason why we should be sure or we have confidence in his return. And then lastly, because of his first coming, because of his first coming, right? That's not debatable. He came once, Jesus came. And when he came, he did everything that was required of him for sinners to be saved and reconciled to God, to God. And he defeated the devil, you know, sin and death when he died on the cross and then when he rose from the grave. He accomplished the Father's will and the work of redemption perfectly in his first coming. But his kingdom wasn't consummated yet. It's not complete yet, though, right? And he left his disciples, his followers, also with a mission to do, the Great Commission. You know, it says, go and make disciples of all nations. He gave the Holy Spirit to his followers and said, You'll be empowered by me. I will be with you in this way because my spirit, the Holy Spirit resides within you. But that was still, you know, this is the work that needs to be done now, but it was anticipation of the work that he would, of all things being completed when he returns. Comes back. So because he came the first time and he did everything he was supposed to complete, we can be sure that he will return. Because if he doesn't return, what he did the first time when he came won't be complete. In a sense, you could almost say this, you know, if Jesus died on the cross and he did not rise from the dead, no matter how great Jesus' death and sacrifice was, if he did not raise, the cross has no power. The cross does not defeat sin and Satan and death. He had to raise. He had to rise. He had to resurrect. Well, if what he did in the first time in his work of redemption, if he doesn't return, then, you know, it's just like we're waiting. It's like it's incomplete. So if that's true and that's what he's begun and that's what he's accomplished, then he must return to make all those things complete, to finish the work, quote-unquote, in that sense, okay? even though his cross and his resurrection you know, is enough for our sin, etc. But he, he must return. And so we can be certain as well that he will return because of his first coming. Okay, all right. So with all that in mind, then I do want us to consider then, okay, so what? How does this, or why does this matter to us now? Um, the second coming of Christ is not just for the future, meaning, you know, the people who happen to be around when Jesus does come, right? And yes, I would like to be of that generation. I don't know how many of you would. I hope you would. But amen, if you, yes, yes, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. So maybe, maybe it still will be us, or I'm a little older, so maybe it'll be some of you or uh, something too, right? Um, but it's not just for those who are here when he comes. It's for all of his followers. 
And you know, when you look at the history of the church and the followers of Christ, they knew this. They really looked to the second coming of Christ as hope, as motivation in the present. It mattered to their lives in the, in the here and now, in the then, you know, when they're alive. But throughout the ages, it's always been front and center to the hearts of those who follow Christ, that he will return. Okay. Now, what's happened, though, perhaps, is it's been neglected some. And I think in our age, in our culture, part of it is because we're so focused on the here and now. And, you know, I make fun of those terms sometimes, too, you know, YOLO and FOMO and stuff and, you know, things like that. I also make fun because some of you guys care so much about those things. So I just I want to kind of, you know, <laughs> cut you guys a little but but like and, and it's not just you I know there's people out there that it's much more urgent than life or death and stuff but the Christian is not supposed to live that way the Christian is not supposed to think that way okay? doesn't mean we don't have an urgency in this life or we don't want to make the most of this life we certainly ought to but the things we focus on are eternal in that way right uh, there's a different type of perspective as to what is important and a lot of what fuels that, or should, is also the fact that Christ will return. Another way to put it is this, and as a church, we try to do this, and hopefully you get that. We sang about the cross. We talk about you know, what Christ has accomplished, his work of redemption. We talk about the gospel. We want to be gospel-centered. We, t- we look back at the work of Christ, and we're supposed to do that, right? We need to do that daily. But... We can't miss out on looking forward to his return and how that should also affect our lives as well. And they go hand in hand. We don't separate the two. His work in the past is important. But the Christian also knew this, and we see that in scriptures, that as they look back to what Christ had accomplished and what the gospel means and how that affects their lives now, they also looked forward to the promise of his return. And that affected how they live now too. And I'll give you some Uh, examples of that as well. But let's look at some of the things that the second coming of Jesus should give us. And we don't want to miss out on this important aspect of the person and work of Christ and the motivation, any motivation and hope in the Christian life, which is his second coming. So what are some of the things that Jesus' second coming should give us and provide for us? One, comfort. Comfort. And that's been true throughout the ages. Christians have been comforted in tribulation and suffering because they knew who they were waiting for. You could look back at Christ and you could receive comfort because he suffered on the cross. And that's an important area where in our comfort, even though we don't know all the reasons why we're suffering, we can look back and say, well, Christ, God, the Son of God, the innocent one, he suffered. And he did not deserve to suffer in any way, shape, and form. He was truly innocent. And so even in our suffering, when we feel like it's undeserved and life is going against us, well, we know someone who truly suffered without ever doing anything wrong, right? And so in that sense, we could have some comfort as well in his suffering. But we also, in our suffering, look forward. And we know that we're comforted because he will come back. And so that gives us a sense of comfort as we look forward, that this is not the end. And he promises that. So you see how that forward also is part of how we deal with that in the present, too, that forward-looking of Christ, okay? Um, What else? The Bible talks about we have this blessed hope in the return of Christ. Uh, Titus 2, uh, verses 11 through 13. Let me read that. Uh, It says this in Titus 2, starting from verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Verse 13, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. What is he talking about in verse 13? I have to be honest. Sometimes when I've read this in the past, I just kind of gloss over it and I assume that he's talking about Jesus' first coming, that he was here, you know, and that was glorious. And, and, you know, talks about, you know, being our Savior. So I'm kind of assuming that it's talking about, like, his first coming. But that's not what he's talking about. He says, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is focused on his second coming. That's what the focus of this passage is. And many of the New Testament scriptures actually, um, they're more uh, keen on or focusing on his second coming, his return. 
So in this passage, we see, you know, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. So that's Jesus' first coming. That's the gospel. He brought salvation. And then through that, we've also experienced this, you know, change and this growth, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. So the gospel, Jesus, what he's done should affect how we live now in terms of growing and holiness and, you know, discipline, etc. But you guys see, verse 13 is also part of that too, waiting for our blessed hope. That's another reason why we also do these things, because we have this hope that he will appear again. He will come again. Understand? Um, so we have this blessed hope in his return. It's centered on the person of Christ. And then thirdly, and I've touched upon that in this verse, as we think about the second coming, it gives us motivation to live holy lives. It gives motivation to live holy lives. Right? So if you and all of us do, if we struggle with just trying to you know, live for Christ, fight sin, you know, battle temptation, etc. If we need more incentive, motivation to live holy lives, it's not just because of what Christ has done, but it's also this aspect of that he will return, right? And that was true for the Christian. So we saw that in that Titus passage, okay, that this waiting for the blessed hope also motivates a Christian to live a holy life because they're not just looking back, they're also looking forward to when he comes. And the thought there is this, when we look forward and we're trying to live obediently and we're trying to you know, uh, obey his commands and, and, and follow his ways and, and live in a, in a holy manner, we know that he's going to come again. And when he appears, right, he will take account for how we've lived. Right? So the righteous judge will come and he will reward those accordingly. But that future looking of his return is also part of our motivation for how we live now. And we'll see that too. We'll see that in some of the parables in chapter 25 as well. So our motivation to live holy lives is not just because of what Christ has accomplished, but also that he will return. And the second coming should give us more motivation, right? Uh, another thing, a couple more. Perseverance, perseverance. Right? Knowing that Jesus will return, it helps his people endure. It helps his people persevere. Um, there's, there's these terms for the church that are described broadly for the state of the church. Okay. Um, one is, uh, like in theology and um, you know, the study of the church, one term is called the church militant. The church militant. Okay. And that is, um, and it applies to now, you know, the condition of the church now and believers who are in the church now. We are part of the church militant, meaning that it's a battle. Followers of Christ are in the midst of battle. We're battling against the world. We're battling against the devil. We're battling against our own flesh. There's regular trials and tribulations that we face. We're going to feel overwhelmed and beaten at times too. Right? Um, there's sorrows. There's gloom as well in this life as we live this life. There are triumphs and victories. There are little graces that we all experience too. So we get glimpses of that. So praise God for that. But if we're honest too, if you experience a victory in your life, or let's say you're even like battling sin, and let's say God works in your heart and sanctifies you in that area, you also know that there's a battle around the corner. <laughs> you know, it's like one thing changes or one thing, you know, you experience God. Well, you know, a couple of days later, there's something else, right? Or, or God deals with one thing in your heart. And then after that, it's like, oh, well, there's this too. So as a follower of Christ in this life, we need to be militant in that way. We need to know that there are battles that we face all the time. Okay? Um, and that's, that's the norm. But we need to be ready. We need to be vigilant. And the fact that we know that Christ, our commander-in-chief, our king, will return should help us persevere and endure as we await his coming. We do what we're supposed to. We continue to fight. We continue that because we know that he is coming back. So it gives us this hope. It, it helps us persevere in this life. Okay? And then we also know this, though. When he returns, the church will no longer be the church militant. It will be the church triumphant. It will be everything that God intended his bride to be. Right? And so because we know he is triumphant, when he returns, they'll be fully realized. There'll be no more sorrow, no more gloom, no more struggle. Okay? But 
his return fuels that understanding as well, that here in this life, yes, we need to battle, we need to fight, but there will be a day when he comes back. There's his victory. There's his triumph, fully, completely. And there's that joy and the fullness of joy that we will have because he's coming back, because our king's coming back, because our general is coming back. And then lastly, the second coming should provide for us now this deep longing, this deep longing, right? a good longing. You know, we are longing for his coming. And that's why the Bible talks about, you know, and says that phrase, come, Lord Jesus, come. You know, that's Maranatha. Come, Jesus, come. Right? We sing about that. Um, we're looking for his appearing. We're waiting for his appearing. Uh, the Greek word, actually, for one of the words that's used often for his second coming is parousia, parousia, right? And what that word means, one of the meanings with that connotation is appearing, that he will appear physically. He will appear truly, literally, right? But the, the main meaning of that word is presence, presence, that he will be present, that he will be present. Okay? That's what it means when he returns. His presence will truly be in our midst. He will be present with his people. Like I said, every time we experience a spiritual sense of his presence, that's glorious, that's great, and I long for that. But there will be a day when he will be present with his people. He will truly be present with his people, right? Fully. He will appear and be amongst his people. That's what we long for. That's what we wait for. And I hope you guys get glimpses with this. Let me close with this. When we worship, for example, because I know worship kind of affects our hearts more than, you know, other things, maybe like preaching or reading or something like that. And we experience God's presence through those means too, and we ought to. But when we're worshiping or when we're praying, maybe there are times, I hope all of you have those times, you know, at least somewhat regularly, as we should. We experience the presence of Christ. Right? And, and there is something of like the longing in your heart, the tension in your heart, the sadness in your heart or something, you recognize or you sense that he is with you. It's not just something you know here, but you're, experience, you're, you're having this experience. It's experiential. God is with me. He's in our midst. When we worship, something clicks with some of the words, and you're like, I sense that he's real, right? Now, imagine that you have glimpses of that, and when we do, I think it really does affect us as far as of Christ. It fills us. It, it gives us the strength even to continue. You know, I know for me as a pastor, as someone who is in ministry, there's times where, you know, I've confessed this. I may ask, like, is it worth it? Should I keep doing it? Should I keep, like Steve just pre uh, said, too, in the prayer, like, if you're not here, God, and I'm preaching and I'm doing this, what am I doing? I'm wasting my time, right? So it's like, Lord, we need you. We want for your presence. And so when that happens, and we're at least aware that's happening, because sometimes this happens and we don't, we're not aware, but how great that is. And there is this, this sense of, like, life that comes within us. It should. I know that happens with me. And now I'm reminded, I, I could keep going. God, you've met me. Thank you. I could keep going, right? I need that. Okay. Now imagine, though, if that's intensified by, I don't know, hundreds, thousands of times, right? That's what it's going to be like when we're in his presence, when he returns, when we see him face to face. There'll be no more longing. There'll be no more doubts. There'll be no more struggle because we see him face to face. And that should create within us this deep longing, this looking forward to that nothing in this world can give us. And that should fill the heart and the mind of a follower of Christ. We long for him that much. It should be seen in our prayers. It should be seen in our worship. It should be seen in us seeking him. But ultimately, it's because we know that that's not complete yet, but it will when he returns or when we go to see him and we pass in this life. But that should affect everything we do now, the longing of our hearts now. Okay. Does that. Does that. It ought to. And more so in our lives. May that continue to grow. Okay. Bow with me. Let's pray. Lord, as we uh, spend time in what you teach about your return, your second coming, oh God, I pray you would give us greater glimpses of what that means. I pray this too. I think I, you know, can have an understanding and see your scriptures and search it and, you know, we can discover what it'll be like and what your word promises. And those things are so important and helpful, Lord. 
But as I was struggling with this too, I was like, Lord, I want to know this more truly in my heart. I want, to, I want to be like some of the believers in the past who they held this hope, not just of eternity, but it was centered on the person of Christ and not just what you did in the past, but this promise that you would return. That's why in the New Testament, especially in the early church, so many of your followers believed that you would come in their lifetime because they also longed for your coming. That motivated them. That helped them endure. That comforted them. God. And so, Lord, I pray that the, the reality and the certainty of your return would fuel our hearts in the present and would affect how we live and the perspective that we take each day, God, that you are coming back. And we hope in you. We find comfort in you. We're motivated by that, not only what you did, but the fact that you'll come. And we long for your coming. We long for you to come, Lord Jesus. And so may that fill our hearts all the more, we pray. So we thank you. May we worship you now. May we look to you. May you bring your presence down to us spiritually, O oh God, as a little taste, a foretaste of what it will be like when we see you face to face, O oh God. So continue to open our eyes, we pray. We thank you in Jesus' name.